Hello again and thank you for watching another episode in a series of videos in which I'm building experiments from Charles Platt's excellent book Make Electronics. So in these videos I'm sharing my experience of building the circuits and seeing the outcome. I won't be sharing component lists or build details or circuit diagrams. If you want those, sorry, but you will have to buy the book. Actually, you know what, I'm not sorry, because it is a good investment, you will have fun and you'll learn a lot. So, so far, every circuit in the book has made use of discrete components, things like resistors, capacitors, switches, LEDs, the list goes on. But now it's about to introduce integrated circuits or ICs, the technology that allows an entire circuit to be replicated on a tiny wafer of semiconductor like silicon or germanium. And we're starting off with this little chap, the ubiquitous 555 timer IC. So whenever an analog circuit needs to introduce a delay or have something happening at a regular time period, chances are there will be one or more of these in that circuit. So, I've built the first 555 circuit in the book. Let's look at what we've got here. So, just eight pins. The first thing we need to use any chip, of course, is to provide it with power. And on the 555, pin eight takes a positive voltage. And pin one should be connected to ground. These things can generally cope with quite a wide voltage range from around 5 volts to around about 15 volts. And you can actually see in this circuit we are directly feeding uh, the 9 volt supply to uh, pin 8. And then from pin 1 we're going directly back to ground. So what about the timing aspect? Well let me ask you this. What percentage of the circuitry in a 555 is devoted to timekeeping? You might be surprised to learn that the answer is 0%. That's right, the 555 timer chip is totally reliant on external components to set an appropriate time delay or interval. And we've actually seen those components before in this book in the form of a resistor capacitor network or RC network for short. So now you might be thinking, OK, so what's the deal here? Where does the so-called 555 timer chip get off letting the RC network do all the work and then stepping up to take all the glory? Well, before we completely condemn it, let's see what it does do for us. Now, to be fair... It would be more appropriate to call the 555 timer a timer management chip or a timer support chip. But hey, everybody knows it as the 555 timer chip, so why split hairs? And helping you control how you use the RC network is where the 555 really shines. So on this circuit, you can see that pin 6 and 7 are connected to an RC network. Pin 7 is the discharge pin and normally this is connected to ground uh, which provides a discharge path for our capacitor here. We'll come back to pin 6 in a moment. So a couple of other important connections. Pin 2 over here is the trigger and you can see that's connected to two things. Firstly, it's connected via a resistor to the positive supply rail. And this is what's known as a pull-up resistor, because what it's doing is pulling the voltage present at that pin up to the supply voltage. And that's important because for the chip to activate the RC network, the 555 is looking for a low voltage to be present at the trigger pin. And we achieve that with this button here, which when depressed will connect the trigger pin to ground, thus driving it low and triggering the circuit. So when the circuit is triggered, two things will happen. First, the output pin, which is pin three, will be driven high. Now in this book circuit, 
that pin is connected through an LED and then a current limiting resistor to ground. So the effect of that pin being driven high will be that the LED will light. So the second thing that will happen when the trigger pin is driven low is that the discharge pin, pin seven, is disconnected from ground. So there's no longer a discharge path for the capacitor. And as we've already seen in earlier circuits, the capacitor will begin to charge at a rate dependent on the value of the resistor. Now we come back to pin six, which is the threshold pin. So as the capacitor charges, the voltage present at the threshold pin will begin to rise. And when it reaches two thirds of the supply voltage, the 555 will do two things. First, it will drive the output pin low again, thus turning off the LED in this case. Second, it will reconnect the discharge pin to ground, thus reintroducing a path for this capacitor to discharge and uh, getting us ready again for the next time that we want to trigger the circuit. Okay, so that is quite enough theory. Let's see it in action. So when I press the trigger button, you will see the LED come on for a short time and then go off again. There we go. And just to prove to you that that time is being set entirely by the RC network and not by anything on the chip, um, other than that threshold level, you can see that rather than a fixed resistor here, uh, it is connected um, in series with a variable resistor and we can use this to actually adjust the charging rate of the capacitor. So I've got it around about the middle at the moment. Let me dial it right up to full and we'll see the effect that has. Here we go. So about a little over twice the amount of time I think my clock's up there. Let's uh, dial it right down to the minimum. See what that looks like. Ooh, very brief. OK, so let's put it back in the middle again. So you can see there, I hope, the effect, the impact that the resistance has uh, on that charging rate and therefore the amount of time that the LED stays on. So there are two pins that we haven't actually discussed yet. One of them is pin five down here. Um, and this is the control pin. And you can see that this is simply connected to ground via a small decoupling capacitor here. That pin is not really playing a role in this circuit. The 555 actually has several different timing modes and the mode you get depends on how you wire up the pins. And this circuit is using what's called the monostable mode, which is a one-shot mode. And you can see that if I press the trigger again. The LED comes on, stays on for a short period of time, and then goes off again, and that's it. Now, the control pin will come into its own with some of the other modes that the book will introduce later. So the final pin that we haven't seen is pin four. This is the reset pin. And you can probably guess from the name what this pin does. You can see that we have this pin connected by yet another momentary tactile switch to ground. So if we push that switch to connect the reset pin to ground, the effect that will have is to override the threshold pin and reset the circuit. And we can see the effect of this. So if I just let the circuit run normally again, so you can see we had about three second delay there before the LED went off. Now I'll do it and I'll straight away press the reset pin. And you can see as soon as I press that reset pin, LED turned off, everything got reset. OK, let's use the oscilloscope to get a bit more insight into what I've just described is happening in the circuit here. So I've got the probes connected at two points in the circuit. Uh, one is connected to the positive side of the capacitor in the RC network. The other is connected to the output pin, pin three. Now let's see what happens when I trigger the circuit. So 
So there you can see exactly what was described earlier, that when I press the uh, button to activate the trigger, is the output pin was instantly turned to high, which lit the LED. At the same time, pin 7, the discharge pin, was disconnected from ground, which caused the capacitor to start to charge up, as you can see, until it got to a point where it was approximately two-thirds of the supply voltage. At that point, the discharge pin was reconnected to ground, the capacitor instantly discharged, and at the same time, the output pin was switched back to low uh, and the LED turned off. Okay, so here's the next circuit from the book. Uh, and this is very similar to the previous circuit, although a lot simpler. And what's happened here is that the entire RC network has been removed. And you can see that the threshold pin is now connected directly to ground. So this is another mode called the bi-stable mode. And in fact, strictly speaking, this isn't a timing mode at all. In this mode, the 555 is operating as a latch. So if I press the trigger button, the LED comes on, but it will just stay on. And the reason it will just stay on is because, of course, we've removed the RC network We've connected the threshold to ground and remember that the 555 is looking for the threshold voltage to rise to approximately two thirds of the supply voltage. But of course, that will never happen now. So the only way to get the circuit back to its original state is to use the reset button. So effectively, the trigger and the reset are now used to just toggle the circuit between two different states. So that is the bi-stable mode. Well, I hope that gave you an idea of how versatile the 555 is and why it's such a popular and enduring integrated circuit. If you haven't already, I recommend getting the book so that you can build the circuits for yourself. And in the next video, we'll be continuing our exploration of the 555 and introducing yet another mode. So I look forward to you joining me for that.